chain, which is really cool. And um, it's kind of like how our, our providers, you know, now accept uh, the native token of these nine chains. And so users have a lot more flexibility in how they can pay. So um, I think on the crypto side, that's probably one of the biggest things that we just did this year. Um, just kind of looking back this year, um, you know, and then in terms of, of the app, the other kind of cool stuff is speed improvements, just kind of UI improvements. I mean, it's been quite, quite a journey. Yeah, on the yeah. speed side, I was just going to say, um, like 40 X improvement. It was literally about 1 megabit per 2nd <laughs> down, down, um, capable, uh, at the, at the, from the get go. So I know. You know, lots of people routinely get 35 to 40 megabits per second um, down speeds now. And so and and up as well. So that's definitely a huge improvement on the um, on the speed side of things. Dan, you were going to uh, add something. Uh, just one of the things that, that people may not <clears throat> have seen directly, but but felt that I. Uh... You know the impact of it in the the improved speed is uh, provider side simpler uh, and eliminated uh, some kind of redundant hops that that your traffic would flow through. So at launch, all providers were configured with an Orchid server, and all the traffic flowing into the Orchid server would flow out to an Open VPN server privately run by the provider as sort of an extra internal hop within the, the ORCID deployment uh, and then would exit to the internet or, you know, on the subsequent ORCID hops if you had a multi-hop circuit. Uh, and through that open VPN server, we've removed the need to, uh, to, to run everything through the open VPN server. And so uh, that's, that's, I think, you know, been borne out by some of those, uh, the speed metrics that you were calling out. Uh, so, you know, the, the server side is, is continuing to evolve and, and we're trying to make it simpler and more, more kind of uh, get to a, a final form that, that I think will be much more performant and, uh, and easier to manage. Yeah, no doubt. And that, that was something I, I wasn't even aware was happening in the background. So when that uh, got brought up <laughs> at some point, I don't I don't remember exactly when uh, that was a surprise to me because, you know, otherwise it was working like I, I've done calls like this one and on Zoom using Orchid VPN uh, when I've been like at a Starbucks or at a library where the uh, where the Wi-Fi network is fully open. And obviously, you know, I want to encrypt uh, as much as I can and um, prevent snooping if, so, if for some reason that's happening or just bell, you know, internet knowing <laughs> that I'm on a Zoom call because they don't need to know. Travis, were you gonna say something there? Oh yeah, I, I was at a, a courthouse once just waiting to, uh, for some sort of jury selection thing and they had a Wi-Fi connection, but they lock it down so you can't do any audio streaming. Uh -huh. um, but that's another use case, right? Is you, sometimes find yourself in a firewall it, with certain protocols or websites blocked uh, and ORCID's a nice way to get out, you know, um, just thinking of that use case. I also wanted to back up just a bit, just for people that are new to the protocol or maybe just listening, listening to this as a recording, um, but just kind of as a reminder from a high level, you know, ORCID's not a VPN company. We do not run VPN servers. Our, uh, we just make software and we have uh, providers that run you know, the infrastructure. Even at launch in 2019, we didn't run any production um, ORCID servers ourselves. And so we have a, a trusted kind of network of preferred providers that we're running with right now as we're in a bootstrapping mode, getting more users and getting more usage on the network. Um, that are all, you know, high quality VPN providers that can provide a fast service. Uh, cause obviously it's important to have people that know what they're doing and can run a fast VPN service rather than just like a host that's just running a node. Um, I think everyone's pretty, pretty aware of that, but I just want to make it clear that, you know, with ORCID, you're connecting to a network of decentralized providers, um, that are all incentive aligned right. and. 
that's kind of a, a key differentiator between obviously a regular VPN company that's selling subscriptions. One thing just to tag on to that also, it it might not be obvious to everyone as they use the product when they're work, when they're uh, getting their connection through one of these providers, their payments are handed off directly peer to peer. Orchid isn't in the middle of that. Our nano payment uh, system uh, is is just a contract on the Ethereum. Uh, well, on, actually, it's on all of the the nine supported chains. Uh, and your client is constructing lottery tickets and handing those directly to the provider. The provider, if they get a winning lottery ticket, goes to the blockchain to cash it. Orchid has no visibility or uh, involvement in that interaction. So it's you know, just just to underscore that point that Orchid is is providing the software, releasing it out to the public, and then stepping back and is not in the middle orchestrating any of that. Yeah, no doubt. Um, I had I was having some audio issues at the beginning, so I had to make some changes. But uh, I can hear loud and clear now, and I think the uh, the recording should be really solid as well. Um, what about for for twenty twenty two? Like, what what has the uh, what have the con core contributors been focusing on? Travis, uh, you and Seven have both been out there doing multiple speaking engagements. You know what? What have the focus uh, on those been? Just you know this twenty twenty two in a nutshell. Yeah, I can start with uh, some of the marketing initiatives that we're doing. Um, you know, I think twenty twenty two has been uh, seeing a lot of the crypto conferences come back. So you know, we started the year off really strong. We had uh, our CEO. Hi. Dr. Stephen Waterhouse, also known as Seven, um, you know, give a main stage talk at ETH Denver. Um, ETH Denver was a zoo, completely sold out, lines everywhere. Um, everyone was very interested in what was going on there. And then uh, a couple weeks before that, um, our head of uh, technology, Jay Freeman, also known as Soric, um, who's a very well known hacker, was when he was deploying. Work its nano payment contract on optimism. Um, he'd actually been working with the optimism team to get it, optimism to a place where, where Orchid would run on it. Um, and again, this is kind of our payment layer that allows you to, you know, pay in optimistic Ethereum on the optimism chain, uh, to other Orchid providers for your VPN service. But he found a critical bug that allowed him to print unlimited ETH, um, which is, uh, very kind of crazy thing to find. He did a great write up on his blog, uh, I think on sork.net. No? And uh, so he gave a talk about that at Ethereum Denver. So we had kind of um, two Good. talks and started the year off really well. I could have sworn about it. And then we ended up going to uh, ETH Berlin and in uh, oh. DevCon and we uh, are sure. kind of gearing up for, for yeah. next year. Uh, but you know, a lot of these, these conferences are back, they're very, populated in a great way to go and, and talk to developers and people that are making uh, very interesting things. Lately, we've also got involved in the United Privacy Alliance, and uh, we just did, uh, I think we have our, our last podcast coming out. It is going to um, have a couple members of that, but that's a project with us and NIM um, and some other privacy-focused blockchain-type projects. Um, and that's been really cool to see, mainly because the public reception to privacy and that narrative has been uh, so open. You know, I think right, Derek. You know, being in this for for a few years now, you, we can see kind of what's happening with um, a move towards authoritarianism and uh, focus on firewalls, shutting down internet service when things happen in a country. Um, everything, you know, from like the what's happening in Iran right now to, of course, the Russia-Ukraine Ukraine conflict. Um, you know, uh, just it gets more important than ever to be able to get that uh, a connection out uh, to the open internet so you can communicate. But, you know, so there's there's some of the kind of marketing and fun initiatives that we've been, um, you know, the, these conferences and other things that we're doing in, in 22. Yeah, I think I'd summarize what the application development team is focused on is uh, trying to remove barriers to adoption. 
uh, whether that's you know usability issues or onboarding process. I, you know, if, if anyone's peeking at the the GitHub repo or taking the you know the CI builds, you'll you've probably seen some some updates there uh, that are in the pipeline. Uh, just trying to to make it easier to uh, you know get started using Orchid. Also, uh, mid year, I think it was we uh, you know, we really became aware of uh, users in certain countries who had. Uh, maybe national firewalls or some other kind of kind of mechanism preventing them from accessing public RPC servers on some of the chains that we support. Uh, and so adding some configurability there around uh, choosing your own RPC server, letting the user uh, you know, use their own local knowledge about how best to, to get connected to the blockchain uh, became a really important enhancement that we delivered sometime in the middle of the summer, I'm going to say. Uh, and, and that's, I think, where our head is at in a lot of ways right now, in a big way, you know, as with joining the Privacy Alliance, uh, we want to uh, find users who are stuck trying to get online, they're hitting some kind of obstacle, and uh, we want to figure out how to get them online and out onto the open internet. And so features to support that are, are important, but also uh, I think, you know, I'd look to the community and uh, the users themselves to uh, to bring their their questions and challenges to us and to also to to get the word out that, you know, the, the ORCID VPN client is a, a quite flexible general purpose tool. Uh, you can use it with you know, the ORCID uh, VPN protocol itself, of course, but also OpenVPN and WireGuard as needed. Uh, to punch through firewalls, and so you're know, really interested to hear from people how they're configuring things to, uh, you know, to get past these sorts of obstacles. Yeah, that was actually back in June uh, when we made those major changes to the RPC and being able to like specify your own and test them to see if you could even use it from where you are uh, and things like that. But uh, to that extent, I think there's still a the client still needs to be able to look at the smart contract on Ethereum specifically, but you can actually force a connection to like your own RPC, whether you're hosting your own or pocket network or anchor, or you could have your own, you know, key with Alchemy or Infura or whatever, and, um, or obviously be hosting your own uh, RPC. And so you can actually specify that one and that helps break through that initial, um, trouble you might have connecting to um, looking up the smart contract, uh, the the staking contract on Ethereum in the first place. Yeah, that's the bare minimum uh, that you need is you need to be able to find the directory of providers and do a stake weighted random selection against that to figure out where you're connecting to uh, for an ORCID hop. Um, obviously, if you have an, an open VPN or WireGuard connection, uh, the configuration you enter there controls how you access that server. Um, but it, and that's another area we're looking at in on the application side is is to have have things degrade gracefully as your level of access. Uh, you know, maybe a, when you're first trying to connect, uh, your level of access may not be a, you know, as good as you'd like, and so. Uh, you may not find that you're not able to see your balance or uh, see up-to-date information about the state of your account. Uh, but as long as you have an account in good standing and you're able to connect to an ORCID server uh, by, by looking it up in the directory uh, on Ethereum, you can get out onto the open internet. And then once you're bootstrapped through that uh, initial hop, uh, you ought to be able to, to start getting the rest of the information that the app needs to give you the full, you know, the full readout of your state. Right, right. Good stuff. Um, okay, I think that's that's a good overview of you know where where we've come from and, and where we are right now. Um, I'm going to ask all these questions. Uh, I, I know we might not have great answers for all of them, but um, I'm not seeing any here we can't ask for for some reason. So uh, uh, over on Telegram, Crimon or Cremon uh wants to know if there are any plans to add non evm so evm meaning ethereum virtual machine non evm chains like their suggestion was the open network or ton which i think is the one that telegram developed 
Obviously, there are lots of other ones here. Um, you know, anything running on Parity Substrate, uh, near native, not through Aurora, which uh, Orchid already runs on, Solana, Cosmos, uh, or any Cosmos app chain, etc. Yeah, so just to um, you know, set context there, uh, the Orchid provider directory, the, uh, the mapping from provider identities to server addresses, that's all hosted on Ethereum. Today, you know, we support nine chains for payments, but the, the staking and, and the provider side is all on Ethereum, only Ethereum. So uh, you know, implied in this question is, are, you know, will, will you support uh, payments and, and the lottery ticket contract on these non-EVM chains? And uh, the answer to that is, is right now we have no specific plans uh, to expand support to non-EVM chains. Uh, the contracts on Ethereum, uh, where, where the EVM uh, compatible chain uh, based contracts uh, have been multiply audited. And, uh, and so porting to, to non-EVM chains would of course involve the porting effort, would involve getting uh, you know, audits to, uh, to get our, our level of confidence up on uh, you know, the correctness of, of the contract code. Uh, and so that's a, a fairly significant lift. Uh, and we haven't been hearing people beating down the door saying, look, there's, you know, a mass audience who need to be, make payments on these other chains uh, to get access to VPN service. You know, if, if we found such an audience and, and, and they were, you know, raring for, for VPN service payments on, on these other chains, that's something we could talk about. But it have to be a fairly large community to, to justify the level of effort. Okay, fair enough. Um... Yeah, to add to that, you know, we are looking at whenever there's a project um, that creates an EVM compatible bridge, you know, we, we take a look at that. I think that there's one that is close to coming out for um, Solana. <laughs> You mean like a, like an EVM engine for Solana? Yes. Yeah, uh, Neon. They sponsored uh, Eat CC Hack 2022 in Paris earlier this year and uh, and got some people to to build on it. So I, I don't know if they're ready for production yet, but yeah, there there are definitely uh, initiatives out there uh, to to bring EVM compatibility to Solana for sure. Yeah, same thing yeah. as like rootstock for for Bitcoin. I've, we've done some initial compatibility testing there, and, and things look look fairly promising. Uh, so, the you know the, the barrier to to getting deployed on on any EVM properly EVM compatible chain is pretty low, and so we're always excited to uh, to, to you know cut, cut and paste the contract over there. Good stuff. Yeah, and that's you know it's another thing to just kind of understand when you're looking at a project that's not EVM compatible, it means none of our tooling works, none of your tooling works. And, you know, it's just, a, it's a lot of custom development for uh, a single chain. And the whole promise of EVM compatibility is you kind of use the same tool set and the same deployment method, the same code uh, across uh, all these different things. And so it, it makes the launching a little bit easier. Good stuff. Um, perennial question, <laughs> which, which you know, we ask internally sometimes too. When Windows GUI, and that's literally the way the way it was written, uh, wrote Jesus, the way it was written. When Windows GUI, yeah, well, it's, you know, a lot of the Windows code has been written uh, already. Um, you know, <laughs> <laughs> the uh, there are uh, ch some specific challenges with getting deployed in the the Windows App Store itself, um, which I think are have slowed things down kind of minorly. But uh, our focus, like you know, like we said earlier at the top of the call, has really been more on uh, enabling access to people who are blocked at the network layer, and you know that's that's where we've been trying to to focus our. You know, are supportive of users who are struggling to get online, uh, and you know the, the Windows GUI is, uh, you know, is, is something that's it's perennially on the wish list. 
um, but doesn't seem to be an, an inhibitor to, to people getting online at the moment uh, using the VPN. So uh, that, that's, that's kind of where we're focused on. Okay, Travis, did you want to add anything there? Yeah, just, you know, it's a, it's kind of a prioritization. Windows GUI has never fallen off of our prioritization list, but continues to be knocked out by more important things, you know, getting uh, connection work working, you know, that that's that connections working that are mission aligned to places where people are getting blocked is always important. And, um, you know, I'd also throw in there upgrades to our server and just focusing on some of the core pieces of our tech and upgrading them, um, that usually uh, is prioritized over uh, the Windows GUI. So it's it's constantly on the prioritization queue, um, just sometimes gets juggled around a bit. Okay. Um, uh, for better or worse, which means I can't ship these people any swag or anything, uh, the rest of the questions that came in were were submitted anonymously. Uh, when is ORCID going to start a new service other than VPN? Travis, you want to you give the hashtag no roadmap answer? <laughs> yeah. Not really, or, yeah, not, uh, you know, we are not uh, kind of ready to give any sort of roadmap, nor have we ever. So um, can't really talk about that. That said, the nano payment uh, system is fully decoupled from the VPN itself, and it's ready to use with any service anybody dreams up that that could benefit from, uh, you know, the, the specific capabilities and, and can live with the specific limitations of probabilistic nano payments. And so, you know, we've we've had some interesting conversations with other projects about how, uh, you know, nano payments look very appropriate for high volume uh, queries against APIs, anything where you want metered billing and want to break away from uh, the sorts of uh, bulk billing or, or like enterprise key based billing uh, that a lot of uh, a lot of systems like like the, uh, the paid RPC servers, uh, Ethereum, for instance, um, those sorts of things are um, you know, kind of a, an awkward fit in the decentralized ecosystem. Uh, we'd love to see projects taking on uh, nano payments as a way to to get peer to peer payment working uh, down in, in you know, at the the lower layers in, in people's stacks in the same way that, that we've built VPN service on top of it. Yeah, I'd add to that. You know, that's been a focus of of kind of when we've been going to um, Ethereum related conferences is talking about that use case, and we're actually giving our first nano payment workshop uh, at Decentral in Miami. Uh, next week on the 29th at nice. 1 p.m. I don't know if there's going to be an online version, uh, if that's going to be live streamed, but of course, if you follow us on social, we'll post everything um, if it is. Uh, but that's going to be kind of our, um, uh, you know, the first time that people can take a class, uh, or not really class, take a little workshop and really start to understand and get their hands around nano payments a little bit more and how it could potentially relate to their project or what they're working on. Um, you know, that piece, since we came up with the initial concept in our white paper, um, you know, we've seen a, a few projects actually kind of take that idea and run with it. You know, Live Peer is maybe the biggest one they gave us credit for uh, their nano payment type system that uses probability uh, for payments. So it's a, it's a cool concept. Um, it, there's a couple of <clears throat> tricky things to wrap your head around, uh, you know, because it's using probability and there's a uh, double spending problem you have to be always conscious about. Um, but, you know, again, just a, another plug where we're going to be uh, focusing on nano payments and uh, hopefully other people can use those in their projects. So that's something that we have right now. Yeah, I actually got to, uh, well, I got to see the individual who wrote most of Live Peer's white paper on probabilistic nano payments. Um, but I forgot, I, I did, I did know about that. I forgot that they, that they based it, uh, on, uh, on orchid systems. So that's cool. Um, another anonymous question. Yeah, they, and, and to their credit, they are, I think the only, op, the only project that gave us credit for that. <laughs> so there's some other projects that, <laughs> you know, okay. give credit, but that's fine. That's fine. Name, name, there was a couple of projects <laughs> that, 
<laughs> but it, and you know, one one slight criticism there, and maybe that's just a matter of timing, is that uh, you know they they built their own implementation rather than reusing ours. You know, we don't capture it, any value out of the the nano payment uh, accounts or or any payments that flow through them. Uh, and so, you know, by deploying them to the different chains, we're hoping to uh, to establish, you know, the obvious place to have a nano payment account. It would be in Orchid's lottery contract on whichever chain you're using. Uh, that would be a win for users where the same they can create an account once, fund it once, and pay for it multiple different anyway. services using nano payments. Anyway. For anything that would accept them, but that only works if projects can agree to use the same uh, <clears throat> contract to store the accounts. Well, I think, you know, and I think this will be, I guess, probably part of the narrative in 2023 is why make another thing and why pay for another audit? You know, why like there's you know all this work that can be avoided. Obviously, you'll have to learn how to, you know, write to to the nano payment, but. Uh, or you know, just interact with it, uh, with the inter um, the staking contract and all that, and making whatever calls you need to make in your in your DAP. But you know, why make another thing and spend fifty or sixty thousand dollars, if not more, you know, getting an audit and waiting weeks, if not months, um, you know, when there's something that has been audited and has so far <laughs> not been uh, exploited. Um, you know, you could save yourself a lot of effort there, but uh, yeah doing workshops, doing more speaking engagements. That'll be, uh, you know, throughout 2023 and 2024 will, I think, be part of the um, the priority, I guess, in terms of getting, you know, showing it off and, uh, and getting other people to, to build on it. Right, Travis? Yeah, that's right. And, you know, I, you know, a lot of the things that we think about that we're working on, you know, we'll always use Santa payments. So it's, it's a bit self-serving, but it's, um, there's other things that it's useful for, but of course, there's a real live production VPN app that's running that's using it. So I think also this will help people understand a little bit more about why you have a deposit in your account, how to set things up, um, and just kind of get more understanding about, you know, what what's really happening when you turn on the Orchid VPN. Good stuff. Uh... Another anonymous question, when will you, I guess this is uh, app dev maybe, uh, when will you provide a location selection feature for the VPN? I think I know the answer to this, but I know, I know, you know, there have been discussions about whether it's feasible at some point. What's, what's the latest guidance on this? Uh, the, the location selection feature request always comes up it's you know something that obviously nord and and big vpn subscription vpn providers are offering uh you know we're trying to play a bit of a different game obviously uh trying to unblock users access uh to the you know the people are at them who are at the margins of access today uh and you know location selection doesn't seem to be the thing that's that's really in the way for those users um, that's, that's sort of answer number one. Answer number two is, uh, to really to, to, uh, keep the stake weighted random selection process that is at the heart of the ORCID provider directory, uh, and, and which is, you know, the, if you look, read the white paper, it's, you know, core of the tokenomics around OXT and the staking, mm -hmm. uh, we, you know, we have to to maintain the random selection element of that. Uh, you can imagine doing things in a more mature scenario where you know we, there's so much traffic coming through that you could maybe bisect the directory in some way and have region specific directories. Uh, but that really is a conversation for a time when there's a lot more traffic flowing through the system. So while we're still in bootstrap, we don't have any plans right now for adding a location selection feature. Okay. Last question that came in uh, prior to the call, uh, any advertising plan to reach a larger audience? Uh, Travis, I think this one is for you. I'll, I'll, I'll preface this by saying, 
advertising has happened. Uh, some pretty hilarious uh, Orchid uh, YouTube ads that I've seen myself. Um, but maybe what about 2023? Yeah, most of our major ad buys you probably can't see or really perceive. So it's things like, uh, you know, the largest platform that is good for Orchid is the Android platform um, because you can buy ads, you know, through Google. Google owns tons of properties. Um, and you can, you know, it, 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 it basically, it's a very good cost per impression um, that you get on, uh, you know, across YouTube, Google display and search. Um, and you can do app install campaigns and uh, the, the, it's probably the most ethical tracking that we found because it's opt in uh, and we don't, you know, they have no code tracking basically meaning that like we can get some marketing signals back from the Google platform um you know just based on people downloading the app from that platform um and the inherent uh you know type of tracking that happens from the google platform of course you can always sideload the apk to get around that um but that was kind of a um some of where some of our biggest tests were there's a, a lot of countries that we tested um i think ultimately it's important to understand the context of like where we sit in terms of um, some of these major VPN companies, these major VPN companies have a subscription business model where a majority of their users don't use their product, and, but still pay these kind of long subscriptions. Um, the industry is in a consolidation mode where the big providers are buying up the smaller providers and um, then using kind of economies of scale um, to you know push people into these subscriptions and um so so i think that orchid has a few challenges there if, but you know we've we've done some tests um we still run um some smaller kind of ads and you know uh, i know we don't have you know we don't want to do any roadmap discussions but you know we're not planning any super bowl ads or anything like that so um <laughs> hopefully that answers that question super bowl like ads when you start shorting right <laughs> Yeah, we're not buying any uh, stadium naming rights either, so that's. <laughs> you know. Are you sure I can get you a really nice local arena for probably like a hundred grand? <laughs> I can promise twelve thousand people a day will see it for a hundred grand. That's not bad, but um, I'm mostly joking. Um, Okay, those were all the questions that came in. Uh, I'm not prepared to take live questions today, maybe next time. Um, uh, I think it would probably be best to Dan to give you any like closing remarks maybe you want to add here before you head into the American Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's, you know, like things are starting to wrap up, at least for, I'll call it very loosely, the West. I don't like that term very much, but you know, most of Europe, North America, South America, we have certain holidays we we you know almost all celebrate around this time of year. So things are starting to wrap up for the year. Anything you want to add before we head into the holiday season? You know, I think we we covered a lot of the, the most interesting stuff we've been talking about and thinking about recently. I would just go back to the theme for us of we want to find people who are trying to get online and uh, are are. You know, blocked in for one reason or another, whether it's that they were blocked trying to use a, you know, a conventional subscription VPN and, and have had a success uh, using Orchid, or uh, especially if, if somebody's using Orchid and, and not able to get online uh, for some you know, reason that's specific to their their region, you know, their whatever ISP they're using, whatever it is, uh, you know, we'd be excited to have people reach out and and. Put us in contact with those people. Great. Travis, how about you? Yeah, it's been a great year um, at Orchid. I think, um, you know, I guess one point that we'd have to talk about, but, um, you know, we, we haven't put a really public message out about this, but, you know, everything that's happening right now and happened with FTX has not directly affected Orchid. Um, and so, you know, as we kind of had in this tumultuous end of the year, kind of down cycle um just want to yeah focus on 
uh, orchids focus orchids community on, you know, how, how can we help people that are trapped in countries where they can't get out? Um, how can we get the VPN app to them? How can we see if they have what kind of problems they have? Um, and we're interested in any and all people that we can talk to that we can help get connected. Um, because I think it's just really important um, with everything that's going on in the world to give people extra tools um, to get connected to the open internet. And we're willing to help people even if they're not directly using uh, ORCID nodes. Um, maybe there's a, a way out of Iran we're using WireGuard servers or a, a specific multi-hop route that you could then share. We're interested in any and all use cases like that, kind of as Dan was talking about. Um, and um, yeah, it's just it's great to work for Orchid and such a mission aligned company that um, is able to help, you know, uh, help some of these situations around the world. So um, I just ended end it with that. Great, yeah, uh, I will say it's been a really in interesting three years. I'm looking forward to 2023 and helping promote this message of getting more developers to use the Orchid protocol, the probabilistic nano payments and obviously continue to help people uh, get online. You know, we've had some really interesting uh, interactions throughout this this year with people from Cuba, Iran, uh, Russians, <laughs> you know, people who are uh, Turkish folks who are, you know, behind some sort of firewall, Nigerians as well. Um, a lot of the, the people that we talk about on the private podcast when we've had folks from, um, oh, goodness, um, connect now or talk now something like that i don't i don't remember the name of the organization off the top of my head but um access now there we go uh but you know organizations who are really fighting against internet shutdowns and uh really aggressive firewalls and things like that indonesia another region um where it's not as strict but there are like entire categories of the web that you're just not allowed to browse uh, unless you're using a vpn and um you know those are the folks we uh, we want to help and and get open access i'm not going to say free 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 as in freedom not free as in beer um <laughs> free access to to the open the full open internet and instead of whatever their government thinks that they should be accessing terrific uh thanks everyone for tuning in really appreciate your time uh as long as the recording worked the way we hoped this will go up on youtube as well and um and any other places where we uh, we think this uh, this should go. So thanks a lot for your time. Thanks for tuning in. Happy holidays. I will use a very blanket statement and really looking forward to uh, moving the ball forward or several balls forward in, uh, in 2023. Thanks everybody. Thanks all. Bye-bye.